independence, love, social convention, gender roles, and religion. Charlotte Bronte's most famous novel challenges ideas on all these topics, and we are here to discuss it. I'm Charlene. And I'm Mike. And this is Jane Eyre Files. Chapter 20, A Mere Conventional Impediment. Hello, husband. Hello, my pet lamb. Oh, I do like that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a couple, but I think the other one was Simpleton, and I didn't want to call no, you. No, that's not that sweet. I don't want to call you Simpleton. <laughs> and then Claude Hopping Messenger or oh, something like okay. that. But I was like, is he referring to her or not? I mean, I guess, yeah, Mr. Rochester's way of speaking it, it's sweet, but yeah. we don't really want to say that. You don't want to say that to me. No. Nah. But speaking of Ro- Mr. Rochester, how about that Michael Jason <laughs> fella? <laughs> I know it's kind of weird to come back to a regular old episode now after the excitement of last week's interview with Michael Jaston. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, thankfully, this is also an exciting chapter to talk about. Oh, yeah. There's a lot happening right now. Let's just, let's just jump right in. What have we got for the Spark Notes? All right. So, chapter 20. The same night, Jane is startled by a sudden cry for help. She hurries into the hallway where Rochester assures everyone that a servant has merely had a nightmare. After everyone returns to bed... Rochester knocks on Jane's door. He tells her that he can use her help and asks whether she is afraid of blood. He leads her to the third story of the house and shows her Mr. Mason, who has been stabbed in the arm. Rochester asks Jane to staunch the wound and then leaves, ordering Mason and Jane not to speak to one another. In the silence, Jane gazes at the image of the apostles and Christ's crucifixion that is painted on the cabinet across from her. Rochester returns with the surgeon, and as the men tend to Mason's wounds, Rochester sends Jane to find a potion downstairs. He gives some of it to Mason, saying that it will give him heart for an hour. Once Mason is gone, Jane and Rochester stroll in the orchard, and Rochester tells Jane a hypothetical story about a young man who commits a capital error in a foreign country and proceeds to lead a life of dissipation in an effort to obtain relief. The young man then hopes to redeem himself and live morally with a wife, but convention prevents him from doing so. He asks whether the young man would be justified in overleaping an obstacle of custom. Jane's reply is that such a man should look to God for his redemption, not to another person. Rochester, who obviously has been describing his own situation, asks Jane to reassure him that marrying Blanche would bring him salvation. He then hurries away before she has a chance to answer. That's how dense this chapter is. The spark notes summary goes just so into detail. Very detailed. I was like, I don't know if we need all this. Talking about her looking at the cabinet with the apostles and Christ's crucifixion. Yeah. (laughs) They don't really play a major part. But I do want to say before we get too far into this, this is a very... Another another very well written chapter. Mm, I really like Charlene uh, Charlene's. I really like Charlotte's turn of phrase and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. I know we always talk about our favorite quotes, um, but I did want to just draw attention just to give you an idea of how the writing in this chapter seems to be just so stellar. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a moment where after everybody goes back to bed, um, Jane is trying to figure out, okay, is everyone asleep or not? And then she does realize, okay, they must all be asleep. And the line that she uses, this is her autobiography, right? That's Mm -hmm. coming from Charlotte Bronte. The words that she uses are, it seemed that sleep and night had resumed their empire. (laughs) Just that. Nice turn of phrase. It's very colorful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I really, really dug this chapter four. So there there were several passages I was reading it and just like, whoo, just... Yeah. Just shaking my head like this is really, really well done. Yeah. Charlotte Bronte is very talented. Yeah. But now we get the mystery. This is a gothic romance, right? Mm-hmm. We've got Jane in the white billowing gown running from the old house. <laughs> we've... we've had a couple of chapters of the romance yeah. and longing. Mm-hmm. And now we get uh, Cries in the Night, another mm-hmm. great hallmark of a gothic story. And a man mysteriously attacked. And then Jane is asked to help care for him. Which, uh, I mean, that's scary for me to think about anyone. <laughs> I'm not a nurse. I'm not doing that's this. true. <laughs> but he trusts her. I think that's what it is, right? And then, of mm-hmm. course, the mystery. I think the mystery gets even deeper because he tells Jane and Mason, do not talk to each other. I know. It's very ominous. <laughs> that seems really weird. I mean, I guess 
you could easily pass it off as Mason should probably be resting and, <laughs> and you know, he's... Yeah, had... Rochester is so thoughtful. <laughs> but he seems like, the, the way that Charlotte describes it, doesn't it seem like Mason, Mason is like slipping in and out of consciousness, right? Sure, So yeah. maybe it would be better if he just rested and then, but then I think it's, it's so funny that Rochester makes the point to be like, don't, and he even like reiterates it, I think a second mm -hmm. time, don't talk to each other. Yeah. You know, Mason, you've heard me, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, well, that brings me to a question that I sometimes have about this, this section of like, why would Rochester ask Jane for help? Because it seems like his risk of exposing his secret through Mason, you know, unwittingly saying something or maybe something coming out of that inner third story room, that seems like uh, not worth the risk mm. for him. But I do, you know, I remember in the previous chapter, you know, Jane, he specifically tells Jane that if he needs help, that he will seek it at her hands. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's sort of a way for him to, like, fulfill his promise, but it still seems a little weird to me that he would ask her for help. I don't uh, know. Maybe I, this buys back. I mean, I know we, we got into an argument in a previous episode about I wasn't sure if he was already in love with her yet. Mm -hmm. You seem to think that he was. This, to me, is showing me that he is, right? Because yeah. he could get help elsewhere, but he really wants her to, to be part of his life right. at this point. And so, like you said, he's, he, he trusts her. And, you know, and what I like is that some of the dialogue in that chapter where he's talking to, where he's, where he's going through all these steps of, of ways that he needs her assistance. Mm -hmm. It's just the way that he says it. And it's more than just a simple, like I said, just simply asking for help. Mm -hmm. He says, like, I want you. <laughs> you know, and there's, a, and there's another part where he says, like, just give me your hand. Oh, yeah. And stuff like that, where it's like, you wouldn't say that if it was an emergency and you wanted help. You you wouldn't, mm. I don't think you'd say it the way that it, I read it. Okay, Again, yeah. it's, it's on the printed, printed page, so you can't necessarily tell, you know, how hard it is to yeah. discern, you know. Inflection. Yeah, right. yeah. But I, I, I read it as like, okay, this is. He's the, enjoying having this. This, having her help him. Yeah. yeah. Don't they always say sometimes crisis kind of helps couples grow closer, uh -huh. <laughs> right? You know? Sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I imagine that he does really trust her in a lot of ways so that, you know, he wouldn't want to ask someone else Yeah. because he wants her and he knows that she's very capable. I think he also knows that she'll keep her mouth shut. That's true. Right? Yeah. Like you said, because he's got this secret to hide. Who knows the secret? Just the people who work there. Whereas mm -hmm. if anybody, any of his guests get wind of it, you know, then oh, he could be exposed, right? Mm. And so he knows that Jane seems to be the mousy type mm -hmm. who can sit in a room for, was it two hours? <laughs> I, I could not imagine how unbearable that must have been I to just know. sit there with this bloodied guy and a sponge yeah. and you've got to like soak up his wounds and not talk to him. And I think the there's a great line that Charlotte says where she says, it could not have been, it could not have lasted more than two hours. Many a week has seemed shorter. Right, yeah. You know, I mean, it's one of those things that I'm sure I've done things. I've stood in line for, for things for more than two <laughs> hours, whether it be Comic-Con or right. concert tickets. Disneyland you, ride? Yeah, and you or yeah, and you realize, like, once it's over, you're like, oh, okay, I guess that wasn't so bad. Yeah. But then it wasn't you, sitting you, alone in a dark room yeah, while yeah. her mind is yeah. wandering and she's wondering what's, happened in the, what's happening in the other room. Is that whoever attacked this, yeah. Mr. Mason, going to come for me now? To, yeah, to be even afraid that someone's going to come and attack you the whole time. That's, that's unbearable. Mm -hmm. But I mean, Jane is apparently very good in a crisis. So I, I yeah. was thinking too, like, what would my reaction have been if uh, Mr. Rochester said, "Hey, can you help me with this gaping wound?" Um, <laughs> and and just and just like staunch it and and wipe the blood. I'd be like, oh, no, oh, creeped out. No, even if you like had a big crush on him, you wouldn't, have, you know. <laughs> well, I would. I feel like I would be creeped out, but then i have the story to tell because i i think that maybe this will be how i would react but i remember when i was a little girl that um i know that my mom really hated kind of like horror movies because she didn't like to see blood she didn't like that she didn't like blood and i um i cut my finger when i was little on i think like a piece of mirror or something it broke and I was kind of afraid to tell my mom because I thought maybe she'd get all freaked out because <laughs> it was kind of real, bleeding pretty badly. And I, I of course, had to tell her because I, I didn't know what to do. And so she just, she it was very calm and she took care of it. And I asked her about that, I think, when I was, uh, you know, maybe a few days later. And she was just like, oh, that, that's what I had to do. You know, she well, yeah. she couldn't freak out because she had to take care of this. It's that's, your child. Yeah. Child, right. You got to take, I mean, what was it just, what do you, when you say take care of it, what, you put a bandage on it? Or did, you have to, did you have to stop like kind the bleeding of like in some Clean point? it, you know, because okay. it was a lot of blood, I feel like. 
Should I put the cold complex on it? To, uh... <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Stop the bleeding a little bit. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think I got stitches or anything, so it wasn't, oh, it wasn't that bad. Wasn't that yeah. Bad. Okay. Yeah, I wonder. Like, I mean, me personally, I my mother was a trauma unit secretary. My father yeah. fought in the Vietnam War, so I don't think I never. They, 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 would, they would never had had any issues I, no, you know, no. with me. And I, I mean, I think about how would I have reacted in a crisis? Yeah, no, I think I'd be okay. Yeah, you just do what you got to do. Yeah, again, especially if I've got feelings for the person that's asking me for their assistance. <laughs> help me bury this body. If you ask me that, oh. I, I where's the shovel? I, I'm, I'm ready to help out. Good to know. No. <laughs> Okay, so then, you know, while while Jane is sitting for two hours, you know, she has time to think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so she is analyzing these mysterious events. And maybe in a way, with some people who complain about Jane Eyre, they think that Jane, you know, doesn't look into these issues enough where she, mm -hmm. you know, she's too naive or why, you know, why would she believe Mr. Rochester? Because clearly he's lying about something mm -hmm. and she doesn't, she doesn't put enough emphasis on trying to figure out what's going on but in this chapter she is analyzing what's happening and why what, what why is mr rochester keeping the secret what has mr mason got to do with it but definitely she doesn't kind of push too hard to understand i think hmm. she she's like more distracted by her feelings for mr rochester which does lead to the idea that yeah she is naive she's in love mm -hmm. and that's what happens yeah love does make you do funny things hmm. like totally ignoring a bloody stranger in your place of work <laughs> you know well ignoring or just just passing it off it's fine well, well and I, I but i wonder if she just takes her lead from him because mm -hmm. in a way you know at this point in the story jane is just chalking up all these weird these weird experiences to grace pool yeah acting strange and the fact that rochester keeps reassuring her don't worry. It's fine. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, the fire, that's fine. It's, it'll be, it's, it's okay. Did anybody else see it? Okay, we're good. It's, yeah. it's so okay. Much. Grace you know. probably tried to kill this man, but it's fine. Yes. <laughs> and because she always asks, like, are you still going to keep her around? And he's like, it's, it's okay. It's yeah. okay. <laughs> you know? And, and but, but then I also noticed that, you know, again, this is an autobiography, but Charlotte does a good job of also misdirecting the reader. Yes. Because at one point, you know, she even says that, like, Grace Poole's demonic laugh. I could hear Grace Poole's demonic laugh from the other room. Oh, yeah. And it's like, just is it Grace casually Poole? drop that. Yeah. yeah because if, that when you're a first time reader, this is why it's so much fun for me to go back and read it the second time. Because when I'm reading it the first time, I'm like, what's up with Grace Poole? <laughs> what is her deal? You know? Right. Yeah. But yeah. So, I mean, I, I'll give her credit there. But like you said, I, I mean, if sometimes you take, especially in a, in a case of a crisis or an emergency, that's what they always tell you is to try to be as calm as possible because the people around you will feed off of that. Mm, and so yes. I think he is, it seems like this whole point, he's not, he's never nervous. And I, no. and I, th I feel like when you watch it in some of the adaptations as well, the actors who play him, they're just, they're very assured, very calm, yeah, collected. Yeah. And I think, again, that's when Jane's just following his lead. That's true. That's a very good point. Jane. So? I must leave you alone with this gentleman for an hour, maybe two. Sponge the blood as it returns. If he faints, use your salts. And don't speak to him. Dick, it will be on peril of your life if you attempt to speak. Open your mouth, say one word, and I shall not answer for the consequences. Remember, no conversation. So now we're moving forward in the story. Mason is dispatched. He's gone. Rochester and Jane get to have a quiet moment, and this whole chapter just transitions into a little bit of a different vibe. Yeah, it's really weird. Like, and I think I mentioned it to you off mic, but it's very hard to pick up, pick it up on the page, like because I don't. As I'm reading it, you're like, this bloody mm -hmm. gentleman has just left in the arms in the carriage of a surgeon, right? And now let's just hang out and talk in the garden. And yeah. I don't know, like. I, I think I, I was sort of torn because I, I couldn't tell if Rochester was being like somber or sincere because he's also like, okay, I finally have a moment to do with Jane away from all the, all the hubbub of all my friends, mm. but it's still, is this really the time and place to do it? This is the sun has just come up. Mm -hmm. You're sitting in this garden. And I, I wonder if 
women, maybe yourself, read it as, oh, this is so great. They finally have a moment together. <laughs> Whereas I'm a, as a guy, I'm reading it and going, is this the time to have this conversation? <laughs> Could there be a, another moment? And yeah. I, this is where I'm finally getting to the point where I feel like Rochester is, he's over the party. Sure. He's he's over these people being here. He doesn't want Blanche here anymore, yeah. perhaps, especially. Yeah. But it's just like... Well, now I guess I might, might as well have this moment with Jane because this is my this is my chance because no one no one's going to interrupt uh, me because no one's awake yet. Yeah. Right? Well, you you said a moment ago whether Rochester was somber or sincere, but I I feel like he's both. Like mm-hmm. he's he's saddened by being confronted with Mason and you know basically what his secret is. He knows the consequences and he's he's reminded of it. And he's like, well, I don't know if what I'm what I plan is going to work out for me in regards to Jane and maybe in this time he's thinking about, you know, maybe Jane's going to slip through his fingers and he kind of wants to have another opportunity to talk to her and maybe reassure himself that she's going to stay with him. Mm -hmm. And this part of this chapter, you know, there's, there's these wonderful descriptions of nature, which kind of pulls out some, pulls away some of the the darkness that we just had, you Mm -hmm. know, and it builds a bit of a romantic moment where these two characters can connect and Rochester, in a way, kind of reveals all his secrets to Jane through this kind of weird parable that he Wait, tells her. He tries to reveal yeah. his secrets. Yeah. I mean, he's trying to put her in the mindset, maybe, of what he's thinking and see what she says. And then to to see what she will do with that information, which her answer doesn't really help him, I think. Yeah. I think it's a, kind of an awkward time to make this reveal or at least to try to dig into yeah you know, we... right. I mean I can see what you said too about probably Jane would be in a weird mindset we're like what's what's going on now yeah <laughs> I just helped this guy what's happening with him and now we're talking about this hypothetical man who's probably you <laughs> probably you <laughs> yeah well, no I, we, I know there's been previous chapters where, where you and I have talked about like this is all about the I wouldn't say the courting process but this is him mm. getting to know her yeah but then sometimes like I said it's it's a very peculiar time to try to dig a little deeper, but you kind of have to do when you can. But I could see where Jane would be a little freaked out because there's a little bit too much drama in the house. Oh, yeah. And not to mention, you know, Blanche Ingram is still on the premises. Mm-hmm. Ixnay with uh, Anch Blay <laughs> in the house, right? We can't, we shouldn't be doing this now. That's true. And probably Rochester wouldn't want to say anything because it's better to have Blanche out of the house, like you said. Yeah. Like, I feel like this is the moment where I'm starting to come around. A little yes. bit on the romance idea, on the, ah. on the fact that he's he's swung this direction towards her. Right. I mean, like, I don't know. Did you do you think there would ever would have been a possibility that he would have asked Blanche for help? Oh no. Yeah. I mean, Blanche wouldn't have wanted help. I yeah, don't think. Yeah. Exactly. She's not built for that. Prim and proper. And I, another reason why why did he seek Jane's help? Because he was like, Jane is plain. She's the governess. She's oh. probably used to taking care of people. She's taking care of a of the ward. Right. Right. So she yeah. can take care of a bloody dude. You know, whereas I think Blanche <laughs> yeah. would be gooey, you know, just messy and want to oh, get her. Yeah. She's like, uh, can you call a servant to do this? Yeah. This is what servants do. Oh my God. <laughs> and one last thing, you know, I know you've asked me before some of the ways that Rochester has behaved. You know, you've asked me, is he messing with Jane mm-hmm. with his actions? And I've always kind of excused it as just a way for him to get to know her. And he's being more sincere and he's not trying to manipulate Jane. Yeah, but I feel like this turn of events at the end of the chapter where he puts puts out this hypothetical scenario about this guy who's looking for love or whatever and has Mm -hmm. this impediment. But then when he doesn't get the answer that he wants from Jane, then he swings it right into, oh, I'm talking about Blanche. Yeah, I'm a Mary Blanche. And now now this is the first time that I, I really felt that He's clearly messing with her now. Yeah, and he wants to see her reaction to He's that. He's trying to get a rise out of her. Yeah. And uh, the games people play when you're when you're <laughs> in love, right? The things that you do, the things we do for love. The oh. things we do for love. <laughs> and so this is what, that's what it is. And it's, yeah. it's, it's all coming to a head now. And we're, we're basically, what, halfway through the book? So, yeah. 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 So, I mean, that's the way the chapter ends. Is there any interesting context in this chapter, Charlene? Well, I want to talk more about the Apostle's Cabinet that Jane describes while she is tending to Mason. That th- this cabinet that has uh, pictures of uh, Luke and St. Uh, I was going to say St. John, but it's St. John. <laughs> Judas. And is on Judas. That. Um, and in 1845, Charlotte Bronte visited North Lees Hall in Hathersage. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. 
um, where a widow lived there named Mary Eyre. Eyre? Yeah, E-Y-R-E. And she saw the Apostle's Cabinet there. And it must have made uh, quite an impression on her since she included it in the novel. And also, North Lee's Hall is thought to be an inspiration for Thornfield. Hmm, okay. And in 1935, the Bronte Museum acquired the Apostles' Cabinets. And so you can see it on display there today. So I wanted to mention that because Mike and I, we have seen it on display. And I find it really cool that there's something tangible and specifically described in the book that exists. And you can take a picture with it, which I did take a picture of. And it will be on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, you and I, when we were going through the Bronte Parsonage on our honeymoon, you just lit up when you yeah. saw that cabinet. <laughs> and you were like, take a picture of me with this. And I was like, like with a cabinet? <laughs> like, I wasn't that... Because this is just... It's just two paragraphs sure. in a 400-page yeah. book. And so I did not quite remember it. Obviously, I do not know it as clearly as much as you do. <laughs> but you seem so excited by this cabinet. And I remember you when we took the picture there, you were posting it on social medias mm -hmm. then. I'm like, what is it with this cabinet? And then as soon as it came up in my reread, I'm like, that's the cabinet! Right? And I was thinking the same thing. Like, it's great to be reminded... You know, with this detailed description mm -hmm. of this cabinet, because having seen it on the honeymoon, I, I remember it so vividly Aww, now. Yeah. yeah, it's a good memory. And it's it's just it's just fun that something actually exists from Jane Eyre. So you can kind of think, oh, yeah, Jane Eyre is an autobiography. <laughs> this is true. This is true. So, Mike, you know that with Jane Eyre Files, I like to do a lot of research. And mm -hmm. lately, I've been really interested in trying to find... Uh, some audition tapes, some old audition tapes from the 1944 version. Really? It exists, huh? Yeah, ap apparently that, you know, there are a lot of actors, big actors at the time who tried to play, to try to get the role of Rochester. Didn't we have, we had the Jimmy Stewart one, right? Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable for Jimmy Stewart, but, you, you know. You found more? Yeah, there's another incredible actor who was considered for the role of Rochester. Really? His name is Gregory Peck. The Gregory Peck. The Atticus Finch. Oh, he would have been so young. He's, he's like Orson Welles' age. Well, I guess Orson Welles got the part, there you right? Go. You know, they weren't really looking at age at that time. Oh I think God. they were looking at gravitas. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. He, he does have a great stature to him and stuff. He would have been a decent Rochester. I think so. Well, let's yeah. find out. I mean, you, if you want to play the tape, let's see how he would have read for it. Well, funnily enough, his line is from this chapter. So let me go ahead and this share. This chapter? Yeah. This very chapter. Great. Yeah, they, what, they pulled this scene. What perfect time. Mm-hmm. So let's play it right now. Oh, right, right this way. Okay, I'm uh, Mr. Robert Stevenson. I'm a big friend of King Solomon's Mines. Uh, did tell me real quick, Jimmy Stewart didn't read for this role, did he? No, it just, it, it, I mean, just okay. I'll go. Did you, what's the line? All right, chapter twenty. Okay, here we go. Oh no, Mason will not defy me, nor knowing it will he hurt me, but. Unintentionally, he might in a moment, by one careless word, deprive me, if not of life, yet forever of happiness. That, 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 that's it? Oh, okay. Call my agent. I don't give the part to Orson Welles. Oh my goodness. I, no, no one likes Orson Welles. Oh man, that was really enlightening. <laughs> Because I, I looked, I, I did look it up. He was younger than Orson Welles. That's that's just by a year. Just by one year. Okay, well, but that's fine. he still, like I said, he still could have pulled it off. But, yeah, uh, that's miraculous. I don't know. I mean, like I said, he's a gentle giant. Mm -hmm. Peck, I feel like <laughs> you know. I don't know if he would have been a, a good Rochester, but mm -hmm. hey, maybe a Brocklehurst. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, Sinjin. I guess we'll see when we get to that point. Yeah, All right. we might have more casting call audios to share with our audience. <laughs> Who knows? So now we come to our meaningful passage or quote section. And Mike, what is the most meaningful quote that you found this chapter? Well, I actually had two and I had a real tough time kind of deciding because they're both really, really well written, both mm -hmm. meaningful and both dealing with the two different parts of this chapter. Oh. But I will go with the second one. And this is basically during Rochester's soliloquy to Jane mm -hmm. at the very end of the chapter about this hypothetical gentleman that's going through has these impediments to leading a happy life and, mm -hmm. and how he may have met somebody that would change things for the better and he says quote heart weary and soul withered you come home after years of voluntary banishment you make a new acquaintance how or where no matter you find in this stranger much of the good and bright qualities which you have sought for 20 years and never before encountered 
and they are all fresh, healthy, without soil, and without taint. Such society revives, regenerates. You feel better days come back. Higher wishes, purer feelings. You desire to recommence your life and to spend what remains to you of days in a way more worthy of an immortal being. Right. I, I was very close to picking that passage. So yeah. that's that's interesting that you picked it. It's just the way, yeah, it's the way that he says it. There's so much passion in it. Mm-hmm. We're finally starting, again, like I mentioned, we're finally starting to see that romance that I thought was bubbling under. You thought it was more to the surface. I thought it was still <laughs> kind of underneath. And he's starting to kind of like, he can't hold it in anymore. Right. And But then he's t- still too nervous to just come out and say it. So he has to kind of do this hypothetical yeah. scenario. And I'm, it must have just devastated him when she didn't react the mm-hmm. way he had hoped. Again, because she probably thought this is not the time. <laughs> but This is very strange. But but if, but I like the... And also, you know, we're both Doctor Who fans. So I, I do like the idea of him, her saying regenerates. Mm-hmm. when talking about the way that the <laughs> such society revives and regenerates. <laughs> um, you know. Gregory Peck is Doctor Who. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, yeah, there's something about that because... Like I mentioned, it's such a weird transition when it gets to the second half of the chapter, and that brought me back. Mm. That hooked me back in because it was like, oh, there's the there's the there's the punch of the romance yeah. to the gothic mystery elements, which my other quote would have been revolving around. So okay, yeah. well, I, I do think that quote is important in considering when we get to that part later that Mr. Rochester is trying to be a good person, mm-hmm. and you know he might he's going to make a lot of mistakes. He's going to do some things that are not very good, but Jane is, he wants Jane because that she'll, she'll make him a better person. And I think that's really sweet. Mm-hmm. So what was your meaningful passage well, from this chapter? My meaningful passage is actually Jane's response to this hypothetical question. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so it's good that we went in this order. Uh, so, you know, Jane is a little bit confused about what he's trying to tell her and she doesn't really know what to say. And she's trying to form an answer. And she says... Sir, I answered, a wanderer's repose or a sinner's reformation should never depend on a fellow creature. Men and women die, philosophers falter in wisdom, and Christians in goodness. If any one you know has suffered and erred, let him look higher than his equal for strength to amend and solace to heal. Mm-hmm. And I just think that's, you know, Jane is asked this pretty impossible and confusing question by Rochester, and she comes up with a really good answer. Which, you know, in, in that time, you know, it's very religious. So she says, you know, look to God for solace. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm not very religious. So when I read this passage, I like to think of Jane kind of saying too, depend on yourself to be the person you want to be instead of looking to other people who may disappoint you. Okay. And- I'm wondering if she's talking in circles a little bit so that she doesn't have to come out and break <laughs> well- his heart. Oh, you know, I like mean, she's, she's not going to break his heart, really. But yeah. <laughs> if he was more straightforward, she'd be more uh, open to what he's saying, I'm sure. Yeah. But, but I just, yeah, that was her moment to kind of show how virtuous she was. and mm-hmm. But at the same time, yeah, it, I just, I feel it, it does, it is a little heartbreaking for Rochester. Oh, absolutely. But I also think that that passage kind of foreshadows what happens later because she's talking about looking to God for strength and she's going to need to look to God for strength for some something mm-hmm. that will happen later. Yeah, and I, I think we, we forgot to mention it earlier, but, you know, you always talk about the use of foreshadowing in this book, and mm-hmm. there is a lot of foreshadowing. Actually, it was the line that we heard Gregory Peck talk about, which is this <laughs> idea of, of Rochester saying, well, Mason, Mason won't be an impediment. Mason will never mm-hmm. hurt me. And you're just like, yeah, we know where this is going to end up <laughs> in a few chapters. Uh, I, real quick, I will say we're going to give you the we're going to give you a bonus passage just because I, I said I had a really tough time deciding between these two, and uh, I just want to point out you know so we're about halfway through the book and we're finally getting really deep into not just the romance but also the mystery and so I just I just love this quote and I gotta have to drop it right now, and this is after Rochester is left with the surgeon and now Jane is in the the room with. Mr. Mason and just tending to his wounds while he, while he more or less sleeps. Uh, Jane says, Then my own thoughts worried me. What crime was this that lived incarnate in this sequestered mansion and could neither be expelled nor subdued by the owner? What mystery that broke out now in fire and now in blood at the deadest hours of night? What creature was it that, masked in an ordinary woman's face and shape, uttered the voice now of a mocking demon and anon of a carrion-seeking bird of prey. Mm, 
yeah. Yeah, I just that that's such a good paragraph. That's a good passage. It's not as meaningful as some of the the romantic quotes mm-hmm. that you and I brought up, but I, I love that it just it's something that, that a character in a mystery would probably find themselves wondering it because yeah. it's such a peculiar mystery as yeah. compared to something Agatha Christie would have written. You're like. There's a shrieking woman in the other room. Uh-huh. There's a bloody guy in this room. Yeah. And I got to sit here and tend to him and try to ignore what's going on right there because the man of the house told me it's all going to be okay <laughs> and he's going to be back whenever he's back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. I mean, it, it does encapsulate the whole mystery very neatly and very poetically. Mm-hmm. So before we wrap up, I always like to share the wonderful reviews that people have left for us and we've got a couple of them this time that we really appreciate and Mm -hmm. they're they're yeah they're they're so touching to me because i just i love doing this podcast and i love hearing from the fans and i'm so glad that people are enjoying the show we did this for our benefit we did this show just for two of us i knew how much you loved the book Mm -hmm. and you said hey let's throw this together just reread the book one chapter at a time and so when we get reviews like this i'm very grateful it's so nice to hear what people have said yes so thank you so much again um let me just read the first one and i'll have mike read the second one so the first one comes from a friend of the show and they're big jane Eyre fans and we were so happy that they left a review because this one's a really good one um the name is one bane lord they titled it always interesting and entertaining in this adorable podcast married couple mike and charlene read and reflect on charlotte bronte's classic romance jane Eyre, one chapter at a time They come to the book with different perspectives, Charlene from that of a lifelong fan and Mike from someone who has read and enjoyed it once before but now is now looking to dig a little deeper. Devoting an episode to each chapter allows the pair to dig deep and offer reflections on the work that often draw on their own personal experiences, drawing attention to meaningful passages and quotes. The results are interesting and always entertaining. Whether you have read the book before and want to revisit it again or are reading it along for the first time, you are sure to have a great time with this podcast. Very nice. And you might get to hear Gregory Peck if you're lucky. (laughs) Variety of old time, old Hollywood actors. Yeah. And then the other uh, five star review actually came from uh, the user named Classic Literary Friend. And the review reads, I just finished listening to episode seven and wanted to compliment you on a very well done, insightful discussion of Jane and Helen. Every week you consistently deliver thought provoking information and views on the characters and plot. Thank you so much for doing this series. Aw, thank you so much for listening. Yes, again, we appreciate everyone who's listening and give a special thanks to the people who have left us these kind reviews. Very well for the present. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. This really helps us grow and reach new listeners. If you want to talk Jane Eyre with me online, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at airguide. That's E-Y-R-E. And if you want to hear more from me, I host my own podcast called Out of Touchstone, where my good friend Chad and I discuss all the films that Disney produced for their Touchstone Pictures label. You can also find me on Twitter at Mike DeKalb. Thank you and farewell for the present. 